do this with a stone hammer or something is impossible. You, you need super power tools and stuff to do it. This is what these H blocks look like, and they're, they're also perfectly cut and articulated, and they fit together. They're like these Lego blocks. And here you can see how they might have been fit together, but it's, it's like some factory was just churning out these blocks, and they're all pretty much the same. You need diamond tools. You need, you need diamond saws. You, you, and in this case, you need like CAD programs to create this. So this is what perhaps the walls at Puma Punku might have looked like. These are just um, ideas from the uh, different architects and things like that. So here, I mean, this is so typical of a, a museum mural. This is at the Tiwanaku Museum there at Tiwanaku. And so here you have these H blocks, perfectly carved, articulated, and fitted. And now you have the, the builders, uh, they're, they're making the molten metals and they're gonna pour those clamps in. But you know, there's a paradox here. Here are these guys, very primitive, they have their simple cotton tunics on. They've got a campfire that they're, uh, you know, melting the metals on and stuff. I mean, this is just wrong. Uh, I mean, <laughs> yeah, it's just way too primitive a scene for what's going on here. And unfortunately, this is, I think, typical of uh, a lot of murals and museum murals, uh, particularly in North and South America. Just to the west of Tiwanaku is a pyramid that the Bolivian government hasn't officially recognized yet, and there's a village there, and the people are excavating this pyramid. I mean, basically, the, the village there is looting it. What they found at this pyramid at one point is this thing called the Potoki monolith, and it's a granite statue about four feet high. It's been broken in a couple of places, and written on the side of it along the thighs are, is Sumerian hieroglyphs and Sumerian cuneiform. Okay, and it's Sumerian. So that, this is a statue that was found at Tiwanaku and it's now in the Gold Museum in La Paz, but you can't see it. They keep it in a vault. Uh, there are pictures of it and there's pictures there. And when we did Ancient Aliens, they brought it out and we did, we used it. Here's some of the uh, Sumerian signs that are on the Potoki monolith. Now what's also there and found at Tiwanaku and is at the Gold Museum is this, and this is called the Fuente Magna Bowl, and it's a ceramic bowl. It was found in 1960, also near Tiwanaku, by a guy who lived there. And he found it in digging a, like a well in his, for his house, and uh, he, he used it to feed his pigs for a while. But the Fuente Magna Bowl is, is a, it's a total time bomb for archeology, span because what is written on the inside of the bowl is Sumerian hieroglyphs, and these are Sumerian hieroglyphs. The Sumerians wrote in hieroglyphs, and then later they transitioned to cuneiform. Cuneiform is also uh, written on the inside of this bowl. And here's Maximiliano, he was the discoverer of the bowl, he used it to feed his pigs. A priest, in 19, this is what happened, in 1960 a priest was there and he recognized this bowl and he thought, hey, this is you know, archeologically significant. And they traded him a house for, his, for that bowl. But from 1960 until 2005, this, this bowl was locked in a room. It was not on display. No one knew about it. But now it's in the museum, the gold museum in La Paz. And, and that, that can't be there. I mean, for mainstream archaeology, that bowl can't exist. It, it's a... It's a it's a time bomb. Sumerian writing cannot be, at least for mainstream archaeology, on a bowl in South America. That, that, that completely upsets all of mainstream archaeology. So what can they do? What, what can our mainstream archaeology do about this? This is, this is uh, some hieroglyphs uh, from, uh, from uh, Sumerian hieroglyphs. All mainstream archaeology can do is ignore it and not talk about it. That's all they can do. And that's what they do. And you, if you watch some National Geographic uh, special, they're not ever going to talk about that bowl. But it's in, the, it's in the National Museum in La Paz. And, and the only show that's really going to show it is, is 
show like ancient aliens. This is the Tiwanaki Museum too. Uh, this is a typical uh, Andean Indian. He looks very much like an Aymar. He's wearing a turban. Uh, these are also some ceramics from uh, the from the Tiwanaku Museum. This lower guy looks very Chinese and looks very, very oriental. The guy up on top, big, thick mustache and beard. He looks like a Mediterranean. These are some of the skulls that were on display at Tiwanaku. By the way, you weren't to take photos of any of this stuff, but rules are meant to be broken, I would say. This, this is not on display anymore. And this is something I've found traveling around the world, going to these museums. It's certain displays in the last five years. Since Ancient Aliens came on, things are taken off display. They're just, nope, get that out of here. It's too weird. We don't want people to see that. So you cannot see this anymore. All right, some, now some of these skulls are cone heads. So we'll start looking at some of the strange cone head skulls. All right, so now we're going to go to the, uh, we'll go to the coast of Peru. This is here, Paracas, here, Pisco, Lima, capital Peru. Here, uh, Tiwanaku and the Andes and Lake Titicaca are off this way. This is very much a desert. So it's the coastal desert of Peru, and when you go there, it's very, very dry. So much of the skeletal material is preserved. And as you go there, this is where you're going to see some of the really unusual skulls. These, these extended cranium, dolocephalus, as they call it in mainstream. Some of these guys have really extreme uh, skulls. I mean, they're, they're extended. I mean, they really look like aliens. Some of them apparently have skulls that would be double the size of, of our own. Um, this is one, too. Uh, there's, there's literally thousands of these. They have whole rooms from them. Many of them come from this pyramid here. It's called the Chongos Pyramid. And so this excavation of this pyramid in that area is like all these different skulls. I mean, some of these guys look pretty weird. Not the kind of guy you might want to meet in a dark alley or something. And this goes particularly interesting. Uh, my friend uh, Brian Forrester was able to show me this one, and this is this skull. This is also from Paracas. And this one is unusual, particularly unusual. When you have, you have plates in your head, and when you're a little child, they have to fuse. And then as you get older and older, um, the plates can be manipulated in your head, particularly when you're very young, and we'll, we'll talk about more of that. But this skull is particularly unusual because it doesn't have the same kind of, of sutures that a normal skull has of the plates coming together. It's quite unusual, and, and this may be a, like a, what we might say is an alien skull. Uh, the idea that some people are actually born, this is a big question, are some people actually born with these elongated skulls, or is it all, you know, fabricated? Uh, this is also a tree panning, which is the cutting of the opening of the skull. Is, is goes along with these elongated skulls a lot. This guy was tree panned. In other words, a plate of his bone was cut out of his head. And then a gold plate was put in there, and he survived, lived for many years. Red-haired skeletons, they find a lot of those in uh, Peru. And in that same area is this what's called the candlestick of the Andes. It's, it's kind of some giant figure that's like pointing towards, say, Tiwanaku. And just south of this area is the famous Nazca Plain with all of these unusual figures and what looks like runways and things. There's areas there where the tops of mountains have been cut off and, and stuff like that. It's, and really to, to see Nazca and get a good view of it, you, you've got to go in an airplane and see it. And so uh, archaeologists are baffled by the whole thing, and uh, me too. There's, there doesn't seem to be any clear explanation of, of what uh, was going on at Nazca. Um, some kind of airstrip or landing thing, a signal to the gods from space. Now, these same elongated skulls are found all over the world. They're found in, this is an Olmec skull from Mexico. So it's been, and this is an area too called Comacalco. that was an Olmec area. This is what these Olmec guys look like. I mean, these are, these are figurines of them, of, of themselves. So they have these um, elongated skulls. This guy's like a pumpkin head. This is at the museum in Merida in the Yucatan. So rather than having an elongated skull, his head's been sort of smashed in, the pumpkin head skulls. And we talk about all this in the, the book Enigma of Cranial Deformation. Archaeologists know that there's a way of manipulating 
the skull when you're a child, and it's called head binding. So you can take a child and manipulate the skull, and by binding it, like Chinese foot binding and stuff like that, you can, you can do this. Now in 1940, until 1940, the Olmecs were not known to exist. They were, they were not a civilization that was recognized. But archaeologists in Mexico had realized that there was something other than the Mayans and Aztecs. And, it, and then in 1940, they brought archaeologists from all over the world to Mexico City for this big conference. And what they did was then announce and, and show all the evidence for this other earlier civilization in Mexico called the Olmecs. And the Olmecs are very famous for these giant, what they call colossal stone heads. They're at a basalt. They're mainly about 20 tons. They're, uh, the, the figures in them often look like uh, Africans. Um, they're in Guatemala too. By the way, the Olmec things are, are found all over Central America. They're on the Pacific side. They're in Guatemala. They're uh, near Mon Monte Alban and in Oaxaca has them. Many of them are extremely well carved and they were buried. They were, they're in swamps in parts of Mexico. They're wearing helmets and turbans. Uh, this is carved out of basalt, extremely well made. They weigh 20 tons. And in many cases, they've been defaced. It, it, it was very strange. This is the oil area of Mexico where, where the colossal heads are found. And so literally, bulldozers are, are uncovering these giant 20-ton heads and stuff. At La Venta, which they believe was the capital of the Olmecs, which is near the Atlantic coast, uh, they found that it was an uh, extremely well-made city. It had all kinds of plumbing and sewage and stuff like that. Now what's important to know about the Olmecs is that they're on the Pacific and the Atlantic side. And this small area here at the southern part of Mexico is called the Isthmus of Tehuantepec. And it's the narrowest part of Mexico. And in fact, you can walk from the Pacific coast to the Atlantic coast in a few days. And before they built the Panama Canal, they considered building a canal here as well to link the Pacific and the Atlantic. Uh, what they did instead, what the Mexican government did, was uh, build a railway line that just, just goes from the Pacific to the Atlantic to transport goods. This is also an Olmec uh, colossal boulder. This is not a colossal head, but it looks very Egyptian. And uh, he's got like a false beard and he's wearing a kind of Egyptian sort of headdress kind of stuff. I mean, he's a very strange guy. The Olmecs are the inventors of the, the ball game and the rubber ball and the ball courts. And in fact, ball courts from Central America are found as far north as, as Utah. And if you go up to Wupatki and places like that around the Grand Canyon, you're gonna see ball courts. And those ball games were played with rubber balls. And those rubber balls had to come from southern Mexico. This is an interesting Olmec head too, it's a colossal head because, and archeologists are baffled by this, it appears that he's, it's been defaced. Look at these scoop marks uh, on the turban there on his, on his helmet. Archaeologists have no idea what went on here. It's like somebody with a power tool, some kind of grinder or something, just decided to start defacing the statue. And he would take his power tool and just dish out these little dish marks. I mean, that's what's going on here. And, and archaeologists have to admit that. They just don't know why someone would do this or even how these little dish marks would be created. And in fact, you, you see these same kind of dish marks and small drill holes on the backs of some of these other Olmec statues that you'll see at Villa Hermosa. So in many cases, like we saw at Sawaman, it's like people have these handy dandy power tools that just cut stone and, and melt it and, and, and do things very easily, you know, rather than taking all this time, they would think. And then they would just go out and practice and play with it, deface stuff. And now this is also an Olmec, uh, this is a, a display at, at Comacalco, an Olmec city, which later became a Mayan city. And it's just full of all kinds of weird, you know, representations of statues and ceramics that were found there. Some of these guys look very African, some look very Oriental and Chinese. Um, this guy over here looks like Donald Trump right there. The, uh, 
this guy's a cool guy over here. I really like some of these guys here. I mean, they're, they're strange. And, and let me tell you, this has been removed from display. Last time I was at Comacalco a couple of years ago, this was not there. And it's because, yeah, some archaeologists, maybe from the United States, came in and said, get this off display. It's too weird. We don't want people to see this stuff. So it's not there anymore. These are also some Olmec jade figurines. They're called, uh, this was a, um, uh, a, a tomb at Leventa. And it's supposedly, you can see again, they're jade. They're, you can see they kind of orientalized the elongated heads. Um, and, and in fact, these strange heads are, these are Egyptians. So the Egyptians did this too. This is one of the daughters of Nefertiti and Akhenaten. This is like Meritaten, sister of Tutankhamun. So yeah, and they, they had these elongated skulls too. This is Tutankhamun. He's a cone head too. You don't really, um, you don't hear about that with all this stuff about Tutankhamun. But yeah, this is a, this is a statue from his own tomb. This is, you know, his, a statue of li uh, his own likeness from his tomb. And he's a, he's a conehead with a long gated skull. Now in Samaria, you have what are called the Ubaid figures. And the Ubaid figures uh, are, have been dug up at a, at a town called Ubaid. They're thought to come from about 4000 BC. They have these what called coffee bean eyes. They have elongated uh, skulls. This is, this is what they look like. So with archaeologists, this, they, they, they say the eyes are, are, they call it coffee bean eyes. It's kind of strange eyes. And then, yeah, they have the elongated uh, skulls. The, uh, the Chinese, and if you talk about Taoist immortals and stuff like that in ancient China, they're drawn too as having these extreme elongated skulls. And part of the problem is in areas like China, and, and, and we find them in Korea too, you, they, they, the skeletal material just won't survive un, unless it's in a very dry uh, desert environment. Here's some more Chinese immortals. They have the pumpkin head kind of thing, which, which has this groove down the middle. They've noticed that with the Olmex too. This kind of cranial deformation happened in the United States too. This is a Chinook Indian from up near Seattle. And uh, yeah, she's, she, she's a cone head. And in fact, I went to high school in Missoula, Montana, and Montana, West, just north of Missoula is a lake, the largest freshwater lake west of the Mississippi, and it's called Flathead Lake. Well, it's called Flathead Lake because it's named after the Flathead Indians. And the Flathead Indians were called the Flatheads because they, they were coneheads. They had these strange heads. Now, in Africa, they were doing this in Africa, too. And in fact, this was taken about 1922 by a, a Dutch anthropologist. This is in the Congo. This little child is, has his head bound, and he's going to be a conehead. This is about 1922. So here we are. This would, when the, uh, the binding is taken off of him, this is what he looks like. So anyway, it's a strange thing. Head binding and the coneheads and all that, it's something else. It's around the world. It's in Pacific Islands. It's in Vanuatu. And archaeologists cannot explain it, and they don't like to talk about it. They just basically don't mention it. This was, I thought, kind of interesting. Let's go the other way. This, the Pedro Mountain money, Mummy was found uh, in, the, in the 1930s in, a, in Wyoming. They, when they were blasting out uh, uh, miners. They blasted out this cave. So this little tiny mummy is sitting there, and he's sitting in a, in a lotus meditation position. He was, um, he was about two feet high. And in fact, they x-rayed him. I mean, he was a human, but he was like some kind of like miniature person. And it's interesting too that uh, certain yoga experts have said that he is in a special posture. He's in a, his, the way his knees and everything is, he's in this special yoga posture, supposedly. Interesting too, uh, just real quick, the salmon ruins in New Mexico, the near Aztec, when they, uh, they found a slab there in 1910, digging it up, and there were elephants carved into this slab. Archaeologists couldn't explain that. They don't, I mean, and it's not something they want to talk about. Let's go briefly to uh, uh, Colombia, and we'll go to a place called uh, San Augustin. It also is a lot like the Olmecs, uh, huge statues. It's a jungle area. 
they would find uh, these um, yes, this is sort of, an, this is the mountains, and it's a gold mining area too. Weird, weird, huge statues. Some of them look very Egyptian. They're weighing uh, 10 to 20 tons. Most of them are buried. Some of them are these gargoyle guys with uh, big teeth and stuff like that. Um, just weird stuff, but very, very similar to Olmec kind of things. Some of them are birds. And in fact, the excavations here at San Agustin were, were going on uh, just right up to the 70s to discover this. Sometimes I find these megalithic uh, sarcophagi that are just, that are weighing 20 tons and they unbury them. This is what the area looks like around there. Uh, there's dolmens, there's all these strange figures that you walk around. This is a famous guy too, and he looks very, very similar to the statue at Bada Valley with the eyes. And again, this is like power tools to do all this, these big sweeping arcs and the perfect orbs, the eyes. This is not something you do with a rock hammer in your hand. This is something that's done with precision power tools and stuff. Um, huge almonds and things like that. There's, some of these guys have like rocket packs. They look very strange. They're, they're dressed in oddball kind of outfits that, that just don't really make sense. They wear strange hats. Um, I mean, this is supposedly what they look like. How about this guy? And he's a ceramic figure with a turban. He looks pretty cool. I mean, I, I like to call him the, the rocket man. And Is that a ray gun in your pocket or are you just happy to see me? And here's, this, here's from the Gold Museum. So a lot of this stuff in the Bogota Gold Museum is coming from this San Augustine area. And here you have these, these solid gold figurines. Gold is indestructible. And you're looking at these guys going like, man, who are these guys? I call this guy the fireman. He's, I don't know what he's doing. Uh, they have sun disks and stuff like that. They have strange look, look like uh, saw disks. They're calling this a rotary disk. I mean, what this is all about made with brass. This was also there on display. These are crystal objects and resins, and these crystal objects, crystal beads and stuff, and they're drilled all the way through this quartz crystal. Now, you can't, again, you need power tools. You need diamond tools to drill through a piece of quartz and stuff like that. Uh, power tools have to be used to, to do some of this stuff. There are cone heads there, too. Here's one of the ceramic figures there at the museum. Here's another ceramic. He's looking like, again, some cool oriental guy or something. I, I mean, some of these guys are just really interesting. And this is the same museum with the famous gold airplanes. And they have them on display there. And they're, there's, there's about 20 of them. They look like these gold jets. Uh, and, and again, they're, just, they're small. They're just a few inches long. And archaeologists have to kind of explain this too. And they're like, well, you know, what are these things? And their explanation is, well, they're probably, you know, representations of, of flying fish or something. And because they have, you know, but the way they have tails, they are not birds. Birds do not have tails and stuff like this. And they have even like what appears to be a cockpit and stuff up front. So you have the whole thing. And you know what? They know what a flying fish is. And in fact, here's, here's a flying fish. You know, they got those out there too. So, uh, yeah, they made representations of flying fish in gold, but, um, and the whole idea of ancient flight, if you read the ancient Hindu epics, the Ramayana and the Mah Mahabharata and uh, many other books, they're talking about these guys, Rama, flying through the air. They had their airships called Vamanas. This is a mural at the Bangkok airport, Rama flying through the air on his chariot of the gods. To have air flight, you've got to have electricity, you've got to have uh, metals, you've got to have machines like the Antikythera device, talking about cogged wheels. This, is, this was a device from about 300 BC. The archeologists were, were amazed that anything like this ever existed in ancient times. They just didn't think they had the technology of it. The Antikythera device was a computer that you could dial up. It was, it was more complicated than any Swiss clock. They, archeologists, they were astonished. They couldn't believe. They, in the 1950s, when the American archaeologists finally, um, uh, you know, figured out what the Antikythera device were, they said, boy, this is like finding a jet plane in the tomb of King Tut. That's what they said. Now, the whole idea of elect ancient electricity, they, in ancient Egyptian temples, were lit, apparently, by electrical devices. And this is, this is totally real. This is at the Temple of Dendera. In fact, there's a number of these. 
And archaeologists have to admit, this is totally real. So you have these strange bulbs, you have uh, cables coming up to it, they're attached to some things. Um, this is what's called a jed pillar. You have like, many figures, you've got a baboon. You've got what it appears that snake-like filament. Remember, we were looking at those snakes and stuff before. Our mainstream archaeologists have to explain this, and it can't be that it's an electrical device because, well, they couldn't have had electricity in ancient Egypt, according to the mainstream. So here's their explanation. This is a lotus flower, and this is the aroma of the flower. That's the mainstream Egyptological explanation for this. But other people naturally see it as some kind of electrical device. Uh, also at, uh, nearby is the Temple of Abydos, and it has what appears to be on a lintel, um, like a helicopter and a, a thing. There's like a jet plane here, and this is totally real too. Uh, it's, you know, Egyptologists have to admit it. This is what's called a, a zoomorphic glyph. It's a gold pendant from Panama. Uh, it's also solid gold. There's this uh, stone that they don't know what it is, is embedded in it. And this is what's called a, a zoomorphic piece of jewelry. And, and that it's like a monster, but it's a monster that seems like heavy machinery. It's got blades and stuff in the back, it's got a thing. And what like Ivan T. Sanderson thought about it, and this is, again, it's totally real, this is the front. There's even like a little skid plate on a chest and stuff like that. And what they were thinking, this is really a backhoe. This is like some heavy machinery, a backhoe machine that was a digging machine that was, you know, they were using in ancient times. And so then people, you know, created this uh, jewelry out of it, just as, and, and, you know, it's a monster, just like, you know, big graders and bulldozers are. I know we're running out of time with, you know, the whole thing of ancient flight, of electricity, uh, uh, airplanes. There's so many stories of people flying in, in Ethiopia, and King Solomon supposedly had an airship. Here you have the Assyrian guys from Assyrian seals, three guys sitting in a flying disc. And when you go to Mahenjo-daro, when you read the ancient Hindu epics and stuff like that, I mean, it's, it's like a Buck Rogers or Flash Gordon story. People are flying around in these airships, they're blasting each other, they're having these horrific wars. And when, they, when, when British and Pakistani and Indian archeologists in the late 40s finally got to the street level of Mahenjo-daro, People were just lying dead in the streets. I mean, just lying dead in the streets. It's like some doom had taken over the city and killed everybody. And then the desert came in and just covered this, this city with dust over thousands of years. And then, yeah, in 1947, they finally uncovered people. And, and they, they couldn't explain it. People were just lying dead in the streets, holding hands and stuff. It's like an it's, it's like atom bomb or something just killed everybody in the city. Vishnu flying, and the whole story of, of Ayodhya and, and Rama. Rama goes to save his wife, he flies down there. And here, this is your NASA photographs of what's called Rama's Bridge between southern India and Sri Lanka. And in fact, there was, it's now underwater. And it's like Key West. It's like a big road that went out kind of over the ocean. It's a shallow part. And now most of it's, it's underwater but through satellite photography, uh, we're able to see that. I realize my time's up now, so um, I, this is probably a good place to stop. Yes, I got three minutes. Okay, well, I'll keep going. So the, the whole idea of the manas, and uh, when you read, when you read the, uh, say a modern novel of a the hero goes to the airport, flies to Switzerland or whatever, you know, and in a novel, they don't stop to tell you what an airplane is. You know, oh, this is, this is an airplane. You know, the, the author knows. You know what an airplane is. So the ancient Hindu epics were like that too. And, you know, they would talk about Vamanas and these airships, but they wouldn't go into detailed explanation about them because, you know, they, you, you supposedly knew what it was. So, but finally, they found a book in the Royal Baroda Library, supposedly, called the Vimanika Shastra, and it was a book all about Vamanas talking about five different kinds of vimana, what kind of things they were, they had electricity, some vimanas were, were cigar-shaped, uh, cylindrical craft, others had wings, some were discoid craft, some were like uh, helicopters. Uh, various India, Indian texts, including the Vinika Shastra, talk about mercury as part of the propulsion. 
Mercury is the, the, the messenger of the gods. He flies through the air, Mercury. Mercury is an element, it's a metal, it's a liquid, it's a conductor. Mercury is a very unusual thing, and it, the caduceus of a, a vortex, and in fact, um, what some authors, like Bill Clendenin, he maintained that there's a, what's called a mercury gyro. This has to do with plasmas, but the whole idea of, of um, the whole idea that, that you have a, a kind of like a mercury lamp or a gyro, and, and what you can do with mercury, mercury, as a liquid, you can put mercury into, a, say, a gyroscopic um, kind of a thing, and this would probably be a, an explanation for Foo Fighters, by the way, and then you electrify it, and but it's a spinning, it's a spinning vortex. And if, if, you, if you take a gyro, you, I mean, go to a toy store and buy a gyro. Gyros are anti-gravity. I mean, they, 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 and they're within Coast Guard vessels and in special airplanes, they have special gyros. And, and so gyros are, there's something special about gyros. And if you can make what's called a mercury gyro, it's electrified. And that becomes a plasma, a plasma gas. And part of that too is that of a mercury plasma gyro, it's gonna be a light. I mean, it's like a neon light. So it's a blinding, flashing light. I mean, it, and it, it, you can't even shield it. I mean, it's, and this is the thing, when you turn these things on, it's, it's like a super duper powerful uh, fluorescent light. And anyway, that seems to be what the, the ancient Hindu texts were talking about. And uh, that's it, thank you.